Last week, we've got Peter warming himself by a fire. He started out leaving the garden following Jesus, and he followed him afar off. I'm going to represent, but I'm going to represent Jesus at a distance. Now, Jesus told him, don't even follow me. You let these go their way. Their way was north up to Galilee, where they were from. Get up there with your families. He told them to go to Galilee, and I'll be there and come meet you in Galilee. That's what he told them. But they didn't do that, and Peter didn't do a lot of stuff that he was told, just like a lot of Christians. Guys, Peter ain't the one we pick on. Peter is the guy God used so we all can identify ourselves in him. All of us has fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have denied. All of us have disobeyed the Lord. All of us didn't hear clearly when the Lord's word was going forth. That's Peter. Peter followed afar off, and his buddy John, we think, it was another disciple whom Jesus loved, knew the people at the, the high priest's house, and the little gatekeeper, she let him in. John said, he's cool, he's with me. John knew the gatekeeper, he's cool, he's with me. He comes in, and the girl says, hey, I know you. You were with Jesus of Galilee, weren't you? And Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Boom. And he goes out under the porch, and while he's out there under the night sky, it's freezing. We know he was freezing because he had to build a fire, and he had to warm himself near the fire. We saw the digression in his walk. He began to walk, but he was walking farther away from Christ. Then he stopped and stood with those who made the fire. And then we see him sitting down with those who are at the fire. And we see that is not the blessed man of Psalms, but it's the cursed man, the inverse of the blessed man in Psalms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, wicked people, your TV station, your sports, all these analysis who don't point you to the cross who don't point you to victory in Jesus, they are all part of the scam, man. We need not believe them. And so he digresses, he's walking, he's standing, and he's sitting, just like Psalms 1 says not to do, and what the blessed man will not do. After he denies Jesus, he steps out on the porch, and he hears the rooster crow, but doesn't think nothing about it. And uh, so he's out there, and another guy comes out and says, hey, dude, you were with them, right? No, no, I don't know what you're talking about, man. An hour later, he's got an hour to think about this. The rooster's already sounded. He's already denied him twice. He can put it together. But he doesn't put it together. Because his whole purpose, the purpose the Bible says that he followed, was to find out the end of the matter. How's this thing going to end? Guys, let me give you a shortcut. It's going to end how Jesus said it would. And what Jesus said was, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three different times. And when Jesus gives you a direct word like that, it's going to happen. And this entire Bible is God's direct word from his heart, through his mouth, to 40 different people who spoke it, who wrote it, who declared it. And it's going to happen just like God said it would every time. Even the minutia, even the parts that you don't know, are going to come true. That's why it's important for us to be a people who know the minutia who know the small things, who know the intricacies of God's heart, who have dug deep past the surface into the very heart of God and realize what he's saying in his word. Peter was there to see the end of the matter, and finally the guy comes and he says, Dude, I know you're with him. Your speech berayeth you. You talk like you're from Galilee. You don't talk like you're from here, man. And he put himself under oath and he swore and he says, Listen here, man, I promise on my mother's grave, my wife's life, my children's life, I don't know that. I swear to God. A lot of people are swearing to God right while they're lying through their teeth. Peter put himself under the same kind of oath, and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. And as soon as he said that, that rooster sounded off again, and then it hit him. Before the rooster sounds off twice, you will have denied me three different times. And he looks up, and he remembers the word of the Lord, and it strikes him. You ever have the Lord strike your heart? Have you ever had an epiphany come your way and you realize you were in sin? 
you were in deep sin and what you had done was no small thing, no small matter toward the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It was degradable. It was horrific. It crucified Christ himself. It was debauched and you hurt other people along the way. Oh, how evil was this thing? And that's what happened to Peter when he heard that rooster go off. You see, the rooster represents the preachers of God's word today. We're sounding off. We're sounding the alarm. We're telling folks and some people get it. Some people won't hear it on the first crow, but hopefully by God's grace, they'll hear it by the second crow. Peter got it on the second crow and he remembered the word of the Lord and as soon as he got it, he looked over and about that exact same time, Jesus, they were hauling him out of that room to go to another location. And he looked up and he looked over at Jesus and Jesus come out and his face was swollen because he had been, been beaten up for over a couple hours. He was tied up. He was innocent. And through probably slits in his eyes and a swollen face, he looks over where Peter is and Peter probably couldn't see his eyes but he knew those eyes behind the swelling skin and the flaps of his eyelids. And he knew they were, it was sweet and gentle and loving and kind and forgiving. And the word of the Lord came true. And Jesus just wanted to verify his word by a look, a glance. And Peter looks and he saw, and when he saw Jesus, the Bible says he went out and he wept in excruciating bitterness. I hope you've come to that place in your life where your sin your defilement against the King of Kings has brought you to a place of bitter tears, of weeping, of torment, of sackcloth and ashes before a holy God. If your existence has not come to that place, you have not gone far enough in your sanctification yet. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you believe. But you need to come and bring yourself, present yourself before a holy God, an unholy individual who God has made holy. And you need to come before him and recognize how wicked and rancid your manipulations are, your lies are, your setups are, your hidden things are, how you, how you do in your daily get around, how wicked the small things are because God cares about the minutia. If you were to look at the cells in your eyeball, you'd see the intricacies of what's happening. If you'd see the cells in the blood vessels of your eyeballs, you see how God deals with the minutia and the small things and how important it is to Him. And it's so true in our spiritual lives as well. And my prayer is that you have come to the place where you've presented yourself before a holy living God and it has brought you to a place of lowliness like it has everybody else in Scripture who did the same thing. When Isaiah saw God high and lifted up, his train filling the magnificent temple, this was a preacher of God. This was a prophet of God. This was a man who knew the scriptures. This is a man who dedicated himself to following God. Here am I. You send me. I'll go do whatever you want. And when he saw God, he dropped on his face and said, Woe is me. I'm undone, man. I'm a man of unclean lips. The things I say, I talk about people. I gossip about people that you die for, Lord. I, I cut them down and make fun of them. I am a man of unclean lips. I curse. I swear. I say things I shouldn't with these lips. That's the very first thing that happens. And what your lips reveal is your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And he's saying, my heart is filthy. Jeremiah said it. Your heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And that's why your mouth is so rancid. That's why at the same time you're blessing God, you're cursing men. And James says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. If you're going to bless God whom you've never seen, you need to bless his creation that you look at. If you hate a brother on this planet and you are not willing to forgive a brother, a human being on this planet, you have not come in contact with the unseen God. For how can you say you love a God who said don't hate your brother and you hate your brother but yet you say I love God? John says like this, you are a liar. And the truth of God is not in you. We need to come to a place of holiness today and say, Lord God, please, man, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a woman of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Oh, God, please cleanse my mouth. And he'll come with the holy tongs, with the holy coal from the author, uh, uh, altar, and he will put it on your lips and say, Behold, this has touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away and your sin is purge. It's time for us to get our lips saved today. It's time for us to get our tongues out of the gutter. It's time for our hearts to have a change that takes place through sanctification, through reading the word, and the regeneration of the word that washes us clean. It's time to repent, church! Peter repented that night. It took a rooster, but it worked. The roosters are sounding off today, and you better be listening. You better leave this place today and say, good message, preacher. It needs to take you to the altar of God. And say, God, that was a great message. You spoke to my heart through your little rooster. We don't know that rooster's name. We don't know, but here's what we do know. He did his job. 
Jesus looked in the face of Peter and said, I created me a little rooster. And his job is he's going to crow twice tonight. The exact time he's supposed to crow. And he's going to give you a way out with his first crowing. You will only have broken one third of what it is your heart wants to do tonight. I'm so thankful God to come to us in the middle of our sin and stop us. He'll come to you. He'll, he'll, when you plan your sin, He will put up stops to keep you from sinning. And what do we do? We dig deeper into it. I want to do. I want to sin this way. And then we go farther and farther. But sometimes when that first rooster comes, man, we'll, we'll stop. And the rooster sounding today. I hope you're believing. I hope you're listening. And it says, after all this, He looked over at Jesus. And Jesus comes walking out. And the men are looking at Jesus. This had taken place upstairs. Remember, while Peter was downstairs warming himself, he was outside. They, they were in this fenced-in area, and above them, in the high priest's house, is where all this stuff was going on. They heard the ruckus. They heard thuds. They heard, they heard noises. They heard gasping. They heard laughter. They heard mocking. They would hear some more thuds. They didn't know what was going on. Peter looked at Jesus, and this was going on at the same time. And the men that held Jesus, they mocked him and were punching him in the face. Verse 64. When they had blindfolded Jesus, guys, Jesus took blind men and gave them sight. Now they're taking the all-seeing one to whom all seers, all prophets, got their sight from, who can see spiritually, who can see emotionally, who have discernment in their eyes, and the blind eyes physically who receive their sight because of this one at his word, at his touch, at his sweet heart. They're now trying to blindfold him so he can't see what's going on. So he don't know what's happening next. It says, when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face again and again and again and again. One guy would walk up to him and punch him, man. Boom! And it, it would blast him. It would blast him. And then what would they do? Hey, hey, their mighty prophet. Hey, thou who can see things in the dark. Oh, great Jesus. Oh, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Boom! Uh, who, who was that? Who, who, who was your great magnificent creation that punched you that time, great prophet? Tell us if you know. And Jesus would get himself up, man. He would stand there again in that blindfold. Boom. He stood there quietly. And boom! He'd take another blow. And they'd laugh again and they'd mock. Ha ha! Who was that? Hey, who punched harder? The first guy, person A or person B? Who was who? Oh, you better know these things. Oh, you do know these things. You're the great prophet, 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 prophet. You're the prophet of God. You see things. You heal the blind. Oh, you see everything in the dark. Tell us, tell us, tell us. I'm so glad God doesn't come down and answer all our mockings and all our jeerings and the evolutionist of today. Hey, if there's a God, do this. I'm glad he remains quiet. His word does the speaking. His prophets have done the howling and the crowing. Forty of them who are speaking the same message. You must repent. You must repent. You must get your hearts right with God and quit playing church. Quit playing. Oh, I'm so holy before God. What does God see? I'm telling you, Jesus was blindfolded and yet he saw everything that was going on in that room. They were making fun of him. Oh, tell us who smote you there, great prophet many other blasphemous things spake they against him. They're sitting there before a holy, wise, awesome God, and they're spewing stuff out of their mouths from their heart that they don't even know what they're saying. Because they are convinced this cat in front of them is just another dude who wrecked their paycheck. And they were coming back like mafiosos that they were, and you don't mess with my money. You don't get between me and my money, said my friend's drug dealer. He got in the truck next to her, Big old bull dyke lesbian selling methamphetamine. And she had some money come missing. And he gets up in the truck next door to talk and she grabs him by the head, pulls him down, and puts a Glock through his head. And says, dude, don't you F with my money. And he said, you got it. I never have and I never will. Boom. And that's how these guys consider Jesus. A man coming between them and their cash flow. A man who was messing up their chi and flipping their tables and messing up their trade, their religious trade, man. They would preach these great, great, big, awesome messages and they would blow their mighty horns and they had the whitest clothes in town. And at the end of the service, they'd set up their CD rack and come back and buy my books and buy my holy oil and, and, and buy all these other great things that'll bless you when you head back to your house. Guys, Jesus gave us something that'll bless us all the way back to our house and back. It's the simple word of God. It's divine, it's very powerful, it's complex, and in its complexity he made it simple for four-year-olds to understand if we just teach them right. Jesus Christ came here as a man, humbled as a man, not as God, 
When he was 12 years old, everything he knew at 12 years old, he studied in his home from his mother and his father. They taught him the scriptures. They taught him the word of God. He knew the Bible backwards and forwards. He didn't waste his time with me time. He didn't waste his time with video games. You see, that is a gift from hell to keep us from doing what Jesus did. Jesus didn't come here as a 12-year-old God. Hey, look at me. He was a 12-year-old boy who said, God, I, I, I want to know you, Father. I want to. And he trained himself. He was trained as a human. And what he knew, he knew as a human being. He had to learn. And he learned a lot. And at age 12, he was blowing the minds of godly preachers down there at the temple in the synagogues. 12 years old. And I'm telling you, if you're 12 years old in this room and you can't blow people's minds, you are far behind what God created you to be. You have let other things sink in. You have let other things become more important than the testimony of Jesus Christ, the power of God and His resurrection. You've let everything else take place in your spirit. And that's more important than the things of God. Jesus looked at his mom and dad when they came back to get him. They had headed back to town and he was missing. we got to go back to Jerusalem and find him. And they found him down there at the temple preaching the word of God as a 12-year-old. And they scolded him and he looked at him and says, Don't you know that I must be about the Father's business? And guys, that is a general statement to all of us. Because the day you were saved, you became the child of the living God. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and you and I are now the sons of God. Brethren, it doth not yet seem what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Behold, now are we the sons of God. We are his sons, and if we are his sons, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It is time for us to get to work. It is time for us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and to be able to be as smart in the scriptures as a 12-year-old should be. We let everything else surround us and take over and we can answer who's this and who's in that movie and, and this rock group and this R&B group and we can name all the people out there but you can't name the 12 disciples of Christ. You can name this and that. You can name all the people in your high school graduation class, at least 40 of them, but you can't name the 40 authors of the scriptures. You can't name the 66 books of the Bible. You've been deceived. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to grow up in your sanctification. Jesus Christ wants you saved. Boy, and Peter learned a valuable lesson that night. A rooster taught him. And I'm hoping you're smart enough. So if a rooster in God's creation can teach you something that you will observe it, and you will study it, and it will sink deep into your heart, and it will make its way to your lips, as it did Isaiah. The only way you are made righteous is falling at the feet of a consuming fire named God. Our God is a consuming what? Fire. And yet at the same time, when he purifies you, it's not to annihilate you. It's not to send you to destruction. It's to get the junk out of you. Because he wants to present to himself a pure, righteous, holy nation without spot, without wrinkle. And you'll be like silver tried seven times in the furnace. You know what the Bible said does that? <coughs> the Bible. If you will read the Bible over and over and over, it'll burn you. It'll refine you like silver is dipped seven times into a burning cauldron. It'll get all the junk out of you. And the reason you got so much junk in your life is you will not read the Bible. And I'm telling you, man, you're going to face a judge one day. And Jesus is facing these guys. They're beating him down, beating him down, and saying all sorts of blasphemy things to him. Continuing on over in the book of Mark. 1455. The chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death. But they couldn't find none. Guys, these are the pastors of their day. These are the 70 leaders of their day. These were the choicest men out of all of Israel who knew the Bible, the Old Testament, more than anybody else. They had it memorized. They had it in their hearts. When a king could jump up or, or one of the priests could jump up and say, okay, priest number 68, I need you to quote portions of Isaiah to us. They didn't have chapters and verse. They just had whole scrolls. Get to about two-thirds of, of the scroll and quote us. And they get down there and they'd, they'd see in their mind's eye, oh, boom, boom, boom. And they'd start repeating the scroll. They'd see how far up they had to unroll it. And they would find the two-thirds of the area. And then they would begin to quote it and they could know it. Okay, next one, Malachi. We need you to quote us the book of Malachi. He'd go through all what we call the four chapters. And they would say it word for word, line on line, precept on precept. And they knew the words of the thing. And these guys also knew the Ten Commandments said never, ever murder. And the whole purpose of this thing, they had murder in their hearts. They had an innocent man before them who they wanted to murder before he ever made it to the high priest's apartment that night. His condo, his house his compound because he was high on the hog and this Jesus was homeless 
Everybody went to their own house and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray because he didn't have nowhere to go. Nobody invited him home that night. End of John chapter 7, beginning of John chapter 8. And Jesus Christ gave up everything to come here to a people who had everything who didn't want anything that he had to offer. And in their hearts was murder. And in their hearts they had murder. But their law stated they need witnesses before they could murder him. We can't just go all willy-nilly and murder him. So we want to murder him, but we need witnesses. And they found none. But they kept looking. Verse 56. For many came in as witnesses to bear false witness against him, but their witnesses didn't even agree with each other. This guy would come in and say, yeah, I saw him doing this, 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 and this. And the other guy would come in and say, yeah, I saw him doing this, 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 and that. What? Okay, this and that don't work together. Now, what do you see? This or that? I saw that. Oh, dang, okay. Next witnesses. We need some witnesses. What do you see? I saw this, 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 that, that, that. What do you see? I saw that, that, this, this, that, this, and that. Oh, that didn't agree. Send him out. We need more people. We need this guy murdered. Will somebody freaking agree? You can find some people out in the world who will agree against Jesus right now who have murder in their hearts. They hate the God of creation. They hate the Creator. They hate Him with a passion and they want Him dead. They're preaching behind pulpits today. They say Christ and they say Jesus and they'll even read the Bible. But they want Him crucified. They don't like the Jesus of the Bible. They like the Jesus they conjured up in their own wicked hearts and imaginations. The American Jesus. That white porcelain guy from the Vatican. They like Him. The one with the nice cropped beard and the one who died on a cross like this. They love Him. They don't love the one you find in the Bible who was tore up so bad from the floor up that he was destroyed and ripped apart and the Bible says you couldn't, you wouldn't recognize it. Is that a human up there or have they skinned an animal? He couldn't even be known by his face. His visage was marred beyond recognition. We are told that in the book of Isaiah. That's the Jesus we serve. Have you ever see a picture like that? Mel Gibson's movie didn't even come close to that. Oh, that's the closest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, until you can't recognize him as a human being, then that's the closest thing you've ever seen. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and me. And he did it at the hands of these blasphemous people who said they knew the Bible and they didn't even believe in the resurrection. They didn't even believe in angels. They didn't even believe in afterlife, just like many people today. Oh, everybody goes to heaven. Nobody goes to hell. God loves us all. Those people who preach about hell, why, they're meanies. And I think the people who preach about hell read it in the Bible one day and they believed it. Because it's all in the Bible, all over the Bible. Jesus Christ introduces us to a story in Luke chapter 16 of a rich man who went to hell and the poor man who went to heaven on the paradise side. And he says they were able to communicate between one another. Paradise was awesome, the Abrahamic bosom, and the place of hell was atrocious. Imagine playing football or playing a sport or working hard real day and being so thirsty and that oh, nice cool water just goes down so good and so fast. And, oh man, it takes care of you. That parched throat is now soothed. The people in hell didn't get that. He was begging for water. Just a drop of water, man. It doesn't happen. You have eternal thirst without any kind of sustenance, without any kind of being satisfied. Oh, please. And guys, that's just the holding cell for hell. That's not the real gig. That comes later. If Jesus presented us a hell, and folks, you better believe in a hell today because Jesus is God. And when you make fun of the, His words, you are blaspheming like these men who were punching Him in the face and spoke they many blasphemies concerning Him that day time for us to get our hearts right and our lips right with the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, and let that continually come out of my mouth. That's why David was the man after God's own heart. Because he let the Word, the Word come out of his mouth. He let the Word into his heart and out of his mouth. Into his heart and out of his mouth. Matter of fact, so much of the Word was in him, God allowed him to write the Word. The Holy Spirit came to him in song. And the whole book of Psalms, much of it is the writings of David, who had a heart for God, who had a love for God, who wrote true songs. If you guys want to see some real Christianity, some real godly songs, Get off of Air One, get off of Caleb and start reading your Psalms. In that, you're going to find the very heart of God. And God looks at David and says, boy, he writes it like I love it. The man after God's own heart. And it's time for us to start singing the Psalms to the Lord. Or the old hymns, who included the Psalms. And it says, for many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses would never, ever agree with one another. Because they were trying to find garbage on Jesus. And folks, you never will. You'll never find garbage on Jesus. He's purity. He's the lamb, innocent lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. He's a baby lamb. Baby lambs, you're not going to find anything, anything in their history that will lead you to slit their throats. And that's why Jesus demanded the lambs of the first year to have their throats slit 
picturing him who was innocent before the foundation of the world. He came here. He remained innocent. He remained yielded to the Word of God, the heart of God, and he stayed before the living God. And God's called every one of us in this room to the life of Jesus Christ. And if you ain't living your life according to the way Jesus lived it, you're not a follower of Jesus. It's time for us to repent and say, Jesus, I want to follow God as you did. You're our example. Hey, no man that cometh after me. And if you do come after me, here, here's the sign that you came after me for real. You've denied yourself. You've picked up your cross and you have followed me. Christianity today, we, we don't want to deny ourselves. Not denying yourself makes you a Satanist. They love themselves. They worship themselves. They want their way, their manipulations. What I say, go, I'm going to control everybody in my life. I'm Jezebel. I'm looking for Ahabs. That's this world. Jezebel and Ahab. Quit controlling people, Satan. God guides us as a shepherd. He says, come on, y'all. Cattle are driven. Ha! Come on! Ha! 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 Boom! Cattle prods. You don't hear of a sheep prod. They know the voice of their shepherd. Time to go! And they follow him. My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. Do you hear the voice of the Lord today? Do you hear what God is telling your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in your heart today? It's time for you to activate belief, repentance, and obedience. Do what he's telling you to do today. Because there are no false witnesses against Jesus Christ, and don't you be one. They were looking all over for false witnesses. If they had only looked downstairs by the fire, they would have found one. He was with Jesus. He was a true witness. But this night, he became a false witness. This night, when Jesus needed somebody to stand up and defend him and say, I've been with him for three years, you will find no fault in him at all. This guy was downstairs saying, I don't even know the cat. And some of us are like that with our neighbors. In our denials, I don't know him, Jesus. He ain't that big a deal to me. Hell ain't that big a deal for me. He's going to hell. Pen and teller. Pen's an atheist. Hates God with a passion. One night after a show, somebody walked up to him and gave him a Bible and says, God really put it on my heart to hand this to you. And Penn the atheist grabbed it. He's the bigger guy with the long hair, does the talking. Magic show, Las Vegas. He grabbed the Bible and was so grateful for it. The next day he makes a video and says, one of my people that came to my show last night gave me this Bible. And I got to thinking, if you truly believe in God, if you truly believe in Jesus, and you truly believe the words that are in this book, you'll truly believe in a hell. How much do you have to hate someone, if you believe in a hell, for you not to warn them of that hell? How much do you have to hate them? This is Penn telling us on video. You can find it right now on YouTube. How much do you have to hate somebody before you won't tell them the gospel? Satan's got us all, and we're under his spell, under his hex, and we're doing it just like he would, just like Peter would, warming himself by the fire with a bunch of sinners, denying Jesus. And his true witnesses were down below. Where's John in this whole thing? Where's the other guy? Two guys showed up to the party. You can't even find one of them. The other one's denying out his mouth, out his heart. What Jesus needed wasn't there for him. I pray it is in you. I hope you are what Jesus needs at this very moment. He's placed you on your job. He's placed you in your neighborhood. He's placed you at your house. He's placed you in this building to be what he needs you to be. And it ain't going to be over the top something you can't do. It's what you're doing right now. Only do it for the glory of the Lord. Only do it having read the word. Only doing it with love in your heart, not deception. Do it with leadership in your heart and followership in your heart, not driving and control. You do it the way Jesus would do it. My sheep hear my voice, and they do the things that I say. Many bear false witness against him that night, but their witnesses never would agree, and they never will. There arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, Hey, I'm going to destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did the witnesses agree upon each other or with each other. They came in and they says, Okay, okay, here's the two witnesses. We agree, and here's what we heard him say. We heard this guy say that he is going, he's an arsonist. He is going to destroy our holy temple. We saw him twice. Three and a half years ago, he came in there and flipped over all the tables, ran the birds, ran the sacrifices, everything out. Then we saw him do it last week. He did the same thing. 
He went in there and flipped out. The very next thing he's going to do, we heard him preach that he is going to take this temple and burn it to the ground, destroy it. We heard him say that. He's going to take this temple that was made with hands, and then three days later, boy, he's going to make, build it back. Uh, that was partial story. That's not what he said. He was referring to his temple. He said, you destroy this temple, not made with hands, and in three days, I'll build it back. I'll rise again. They got their gospel mixed up. Guys, it's important that you understand every word of the gospel. That's why in this Bible study, we go word for word, line on line, precept on precept. We take it in context, in order, so you don't have a pretext. Oh, I want to murder him, so let's find verses to murder Jesus. I want to have abortion, so let's find verses that allow us to have abortion. I want to be homosexual, so let's find verses that make me allowed to be homosexual. You know why Jesus Christ never preached against homosexuality? Because they were all dead in his area. Because they all followed the law, and the law said kill them all, destroy them all. That's why he didn't have to preach against that sin, because everybody knew it was sin, and nobody was practicing it in the open. Even these rebellious, wicked, blasphemous people weren't doing it. Because they knew what the Bible said clearly on it. God hadn't changed his M.O. He doesn't change his M.O. He keeps it the same yesterday, today, and forever. And these guys were looking to tell the story and they could even get the story right. I hope when you go to tell the Bible, folks, and me too, I hope that when we go to tell the Bible story that we tell it the way God intended for it to be told. And we don't add our own little flavors to it, our own little salt, our own little pepper, and our own little sensationalism, but we bring it as God brought it. What he intended, because he only intended one thing when he said it. Oh, the Bible can mean different things to you than it does to you and me. Why? It could say one thing to you and say another to me. Hogwash! Jesus said what he said, he meant what he said, and it's for you and I to have the responsibility to dig out the treasures and find out what he meant when he said it. And that's through studying to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needs not be ashamed, that is judgment, rightly dividing the word of truth. Continuing on, these guys didn't even agree with one another. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, so you're not going to say anything? I mean, these witnesses have just talked to you. These witnesses have just pointed out the fact that you said something, and you're, you're going to be all hush-hushy on them? Guys, to all my Jewish friends, Right now, you need to read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a chapter in Scripture that the Jewish synagogues refuse to read because it tells of your Messiah. And in the description of your Messiah, it identifies Jesus clearly on several points. He was despised and rejected of men. Uh, what? Even his own guys downstairs were despising him and rejecting him at this moment. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid it as it were our faces far from him. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Oh, but he was bruised for our iniquities. He was chastised for us. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, the Father, Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, Yahuwah, laid on him, Yeshua, the iniquity of every one of us. Aren't you thankful for that? And that's why Jesus Christ went to the cross so God could pour out all his wrath on this one, his only begotten son, so you and I could be made sons if we would believe in what the only begotten son took upon himself for my sake, on my behalf. He did it for me. We believe that. It says he was alone. He was by himself. He was forsaken. Isaiah 53. Know it. Hide it. Memorize it. Share it. This is your Messiah. And this happened to him that night. And it said this. And he kept his mouth quiet. As a sheep going to the slaughter, he didn't say a word. As a sheep getting its wool shaven off at the shearer, the sheep just sits there and doesn't bleat, doesn't say a word. That's something you need to watch one time. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb, yet he opened not his mouth. He remained silent. Don't you got something to say, Jesus? Had you read Isaiah 53 and you really believe that that was your Messiah, you'd understand that he's standing before you right now in my absolute abject silence. Couldn't see. Now he's put a blindfold on his puppy eyes, smacking him around. This is your Messiah, Jews. And he loves you today. He loves you. He died for you. Will you please believe? 
And the high priest stood up in the midst of everybody and Jesus. And he says, aren't you going to answer? These guys have just said you're an arsonist. You're a destructionist. You're going to tear the temple apart. And you're going to rebuild in three days. You're going to say they're quiet? In another passage, Jesus says, if I answer you, you're not going to believe. And if I begin questioning you and I become the inquisitor, you won't answer me honestly. So I'm going to remain silent here. That's what he said. And he remained silent, continuing on. But he held his peace. He didn't say a word. He answered nothing. Again, the high priest, the boss, the guy that's large and in charge. I'm the boy. I'm the man. Talking to God. And again, the high priest asked him and said, are you the chosen one? Are you the anointed one? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Are you or are you not? Jesus said, I am. The same words that God used at the burning bush. Moses, who, who do I say? Send me back to Pharaoh and, and said, let my people go. Who, 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 what, what do I call you? I am. I exist because I exist. You tell them I am sent you. I created them. They exist because I exist. I exist because I exist. You tell them that. Joshua, the next leader, drawing a sword against the, the captain of the Lord's host, says, which side are you on, buddy? He says, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Put your sword away. You're on holy ground. Boy, they both stood before him, and it was the great I am. Jesus stands there, and they say, who are you? Earlier that night in the garden, they says, hey, are you Jesus? He said, I am, and it blew them all on their backs. They had to get back up, and now they're asking me that same question. Tell us plainly, because the high priest wasn't there. Annas and Caiaphas weren't there. And so now he's asking him, are you or are you not the Son of God? And he came back, and he said, I am. And you will see it yourself. You're going to see me sitting on the Father's right hand of power. And you're going to see me coming in the clouds. Right here, Jesus says, I am the same one that came to Moses. The same one that came to every prophet in the past. I am he. He's speaking now. It's time to listen. I am the great God. I am the great creator. I am the rulership. Colossians 1.18 says Jesus is the creator. We must come to that realization and understand how holy this Jesus is. But yet he kept himself cloaked in humanity. And he loves people with all his heart. This is why he's doing this. But he's looking at these guys who claim to be the men of God, who do deny a hell, who deny the gospels, who deny the word of God, who deny angels, everything the Bible teaches, these guys deny. Just like today's church. Who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you the chosen one? Are you are you the one of God? I am, and you're going to know it before long. You're going to see me sitting on the Father's right hand of judgment. And I'm going to judge you. You think you're judging me today? I'm going to judge you, man. Caiaphas, I'm judging you. Pilate, he's next. I'm going to judge him. Hey, you're next. Where are you at, you old fox? You're going to judge me? I'm going to judge you, brother. And the Bible says that every one of us are going to judge angels. Every one of you and I are going to judge demons who messed with us all our lives. We're going to be judges with him. And he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. And he says, I saw my Lord saying to my Lord, sit there on my right hand until thy enemies given to be given to you as a footstool. Oh, I'm great. I'm the high priest of the living God. I got the Bible memorized. You're a footstool, bro. God rest his feet on you. You ain't nothing, man. Guys, we ain't nothing, man. And the toughest, strongest guy on this planet ain't nothing. Jesus is going to be the judge and every man is going to face him. And you're going to see me sitting in my Father's glory in power as the judge. And then he says, and then you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. Daniel chapter 7. They knew that these were messianic terms. They knew that only God would be the judge. They knew that only the Messiah would be the judge. They knew that, oh, oh man, only, only God would be the one coming in the clouds to do the great judgment. What does the high priest do here? Rent his clothes and say, what need have we of further witnesses? Everybody in that room had Leviticus 21.10 memorized. Leviticus 21.10 said that high priest shall never on any occasion tear his clothing. And this guy stepped out in absolute rebellion looking at the face of God and said, everything God says I'm against, yet I stand in his stead. 
That's what many Christians do. Call ourselves Christians. I represent Him. And you don't even know what the Bible says. And you're going against everything that the Bible teaches. It's time for us to get into the Word of God, know what He says, and start living accordingly to what we've been saved unto. Jesus, we think He died around A.D. 32, 33. Eight years later, Caiaphas died. And in hell, He lifted up His eyes. Being in torment, a hell that He didn't believe in. A hell that he mocked. A hell that he laughed at. A hell that ooh, ooh, wouldn't happen to him. It's all about this life. It's all about the gut. So get everything you can. Make the deal with the devil, man, and get it all now. Don't worry about the future. In AD 40, he really cared. When he died, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes. And he saw his lead demon of unbelief there. The demons who weren't touched by the fire and the flame in that particular holding cell, they will be in the next one. And he looked over this plexiglass thing, this empty, beautiful area just filled with gorgeousness and nobody there. <coughs> and he said, what is this place? He said, that was paradise. And Luke 16, that was the place, the bosom of Abraham. And eight years ago, a fella came down here, man. And you should have heard the noise you should have heard the rejoicing. You should have heard the chants. You should have heard the screams, man. It was jubilant. We were over here, and we knew the story. We were told the story, and we watched it take place. And this guy came down with a thief, man. He started telling everybody that he had just died, and this thief was about to go to this side. And at the last minute, that thief realized that he was the Son of God. He was the very true God, the one you denied. When Jesus told you, I am, he meant it. He was the judge. He was the one going to come in the clouds. This guy on the cross finally recognized it and looked over at him and said, I realize you're that king. Oh, please remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus looked over at him and said, Today's that day, partner. And they were both so weak. Remember, Jesus had already been beaten up. His face is puffed up, and he hadn't even been beaten with a cat of nine tails yet. He hadn't had to carry that cross up that hill yet. He hadn't had to hang there for hours, suffocating in death, drowning on their blood. But now he's here having done all that. And he looks over at that fellow and he says, Today's the day you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> Jesus escorts him into paradise says, Guys, the crowd goes nuts because they knew exactly what that meant. We've been waiting for you, the Messiah, the chosen one, the I am to come down here to be our high priest. You died for us. You, you did it all for us. And now you're going to get us out of this place, the holding cell for heaven, and you're going to take us to heaven because you're the high priest, the true one, not like this Annas guy. And you're going to offer us before the Father. Annas did this 17 different times. Luke 20, or, or Leviticus 23, he obeyed and weighed the sheave offering before the Lord of first fruits, and he didn't mean it in his heart. He had a religion without relationship, like many Christians today. And Christianity is all about relationship. And he weighed the sheaf offering before the Lord of first fruits, and now Jesus, the real high priest, is down there gathering all the first fruits who would go to heaven. Because nobody could go to heaven until. Jesus Christ came and got them. They had to be presented to the Father by the high priest who gave his inspection and his approval of these who were righteous, who rested in his righteousness. And for the next three days, he preached and he proclaimed down there what we're about to do. In three days, I'll resurrect. In two days, I'm going to raise from this place. In one day, we're all going to leave here and we're all going to go to heaven and we're all going to have homes. And Caiaphas is looking over here through this plexiglass at this empty place. And he's hearing the story you mean I'm going to have to face him as judge? I thought I was his judge. I thought I was going to tell him how it was. When he told me he's going to be my judge, he meant that? When he told me we'll see him coming in the clouds, he meant that? I think everybody in hell on the day of rapture, God is going to open up the illumination of their bottomless pit, and they're going to see Christ coming in power and glory. And they're going to know the story, and Caiaphas will be one of those. And all the Sanhedrin who have died since then will be one of those. And his five sons who ruled until 64 A.D. before Jerusalem was sacked in 70 A.D. are going to be among that crowd who had it all in this life. And they were the judges, jury, and executioner. But they're going to meet the judge who is the true judge and jury and executioner. And he's going to execute righteousness. He's going to execute condemnation under these guys. And they're going to stand, and I don't know if Caiaphas won't be the very first one to come forward. It's going to take place in about 1,008 years from right now. The judgment for sinners, the judgment for people who rejected God, 
The judgment for people who cared more about this life than the next one. The people who didn't care about Jesus didn't want to get to know truth. The people who didn't exalt truth higher than anything else. Those people are going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. And guess who the judge is going to be? It's going to be none other than Jesus Christ himself who judges righteously. He doesn't need false witness. He didn't have murder in his heart. He had salvation in his heart. That's why he died on the cross. He's not looking to condemn these people. He came because they were condemned. He came to save them. And they refused his salvation, like maybe one or two of you in this room, maybe a couple out there watching. It's, today's not the day to refuse the king. Because you're going to stand before him, and Caiaphas might be one of the first ones. Caiaphas, come here, bud. Stand right there. No, right there. And Jesus is going to be telling him what to do. And there will be no blindfold that day. Books! Angel, books. Give me the Bible. Leviticus 21.10 The high priest shall not rend his garment. You broke that one, bro. Never murder. Remember that one? You had murder in your heart. You murdered God. He's going to take him through the scriptures of everything. If he lived by the law, you shall be judged by the law. He's going to see where he was a sinner. He's going to beg Jesus to stop. Jesus is the judge. You don't want to the judge around, bro. I'm going to tell you what to do, and you're going to be quiet, and you're going to listen to what I have to say, Caiaphas. Book! Book of Life. Is his name up here in the Book of Life? Or has it been removed? Caiaphas, Caiaphas. His name does not appear, Lord. Lamb's Book of Life! Have we put his entry in the Lamb's Book of Life? Did he believe in the Lamb? Caiaphas, is he there? Over three, bro. The book of remembrance. The book of remembrance. Bring that one. The book of remembrance is written for everybody who did things for God from a pure heart. Because God expects to bless every one of us. He's not going to let anything you do for the Lord, even if it's quiet, even if it's a little thing, even if it's picking up a piece of trash because you were walking by it and everybody else had walked by it, but the Lord told you, no, no, no. I need you to pick that up and throw it into that can. And you walked on and you thought, that's silly, but you did it anyway because you felt the Lord told you to do it, and you did it. There was an angel right, writing it down. This girl did what I told her to do because he's going to bless you for obedience. That's the way it's going to happen. And he's going to bring the book by on Caiaphas and say, what did he ever do for the living God, the great I Am, Jesus Christ? Nothing. Nothing. A clean slate. There's nothing there. How about the book of prayers? Bring that book of prayers. There's five books, guys, that are going to be presented at judgment that we know about the book of prayers. Let's see about his prayers. He prayed often. Why? He prayed in the streets. He prayed in the synagogues. He prayed on the great days of atonement. Oh, he had these great, wonderful prayers. Let's see if they were sweet smelling in the nostrils of the living God as incense burning. That fake prayer that day, fake prayer that never made it past the ceiling. That one there didn't because he didn't believe in the living God. He didn't believe in the afterlife. He didn't believe in what the Bible taught. His prayers were all garbage. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. That didn't mean anything to him or God. Hmm. Hmm. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for his food. Amen. This food is awesome. He didn't mean any of that. He wasn't talking to God. He was just saying a chant before he ate. At that day, the judge is going to know the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He's going to judge accordingly. A thousand years earlier, a thousand and seven years earlier, which might be in the next year, there's going to be another judgment. And everybody at that judgment is going to be facing the same judge. And he's only going to present righteousness. He'll never hold your sin against you. He's going to bless you to pull out the same five books. And the very fact that you are in that judgment means you did according to the word of God. You believed in the Son of the living God. You believe that he was the I Am. You believe that he did this for you. You placed your faith in that. You began to read the word of God. Not only were you saved, you were sanctified. You were growing in that up until the time you died. We always continue to grow. We never finally get there at full maturity. He's going to see that in the Bible. He's going to see it in the book of life. Your name is still there. It wasn't erased. He didn't blot your name out of the book of life. How about the Lamb's book of life? Did we write that one in the day he believed? She believed. Yes, the name's there. Three for three. Praise the Lord. How about the book of memoirs? Bring out that book of memory. What'd you do? That day I saw her, I told her to pick up that piece of paper. It was a gum wrapper. Juicy fruit. Everybody walked on that thing. It got dirty. It got filthy. Nobody would pick it up. But I told her I was testing her heart if she would believe and if she would do what I said. And I said, honey, you got to pick that up. You can't pass it like everybody else has. You can't be lazy like everybody else has. You can't just let it sit there and expect the next person to do your job. Your job right now is to pick up that juicy fruit wrapper. I need you to do it. And she did, Lord. 
She did. Oh man, my heart was I, I couldn't I couldn't write fast enough. Said that angel with the book of memories. I loved it. She she pleased you. She did it for you, Lord. It was awesome. It was awesome. Let's see what more she did. And the list is gonna go in everything you did for the Lord. Oh, let's reward her for that. Let's bless him for that. Let's bless him. You see, the great judge is going to be your friend if you believe in him on this side. But you've made him your enemy if you won't. Everybody who's ever lived is going to face that judge. Which judgment will you be at? The judgment of blessing and rewards in about a year or so or two? Or the one in about a thousand and eight years or so or two? You're going to face Jesus. You ain't going to have no blindfold on. He's going to bring it out and everything that's been done in darkness, whether good or evil, will be brought to light. And you'll be rewarded if you're a believer. And you'll be condemned if you're not. Jesus the judge, man! He wants to bless you today. Will you believe? Will you simply believe? A belief that takes you beyond <laughs> the facts <laughs> unto a belief that has a little footstep behind it. And not only do you talk about him, but you walk with him all the way to the end.